normally we would be in Romans chapter 9, but today I'd like for us to flip over to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Now let's just open up. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord, that you are our Heavenly Father. Now we just ask you, Lord, that today speak to each one of us today, Lord, as you would have us see fit. And today, Lord, as we go through this story here, this parable, Lord, speak to us in a fresh, new way that we've never read this before. May we walk out of here today, Lord, walk out of here today thinking differently about this parable. So, Lord, again, we thank you, Father, for who you are. And it's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we're gathered here together this morning. Amen. Well, as I was sitting here and I was preparing all week and I was thinking about what should I teach on this Sunday? Should I go through straight through and be in Romans chapter 9, but it being Father's Day, I thought today that we would take a veer off a little bit and maybe cover something else. There's a group of scholars that took a survey to determine what was the greatest short story that was ever written. And when the results came back, 70% said that the greatest story that was ever recorded, short story, was the story of the prodigal son. Now, to qualify as great, a story must be able to read time and time again, and each time that you read it, it'll make a different impact on you. That's considered a great story. But every time you read it, it'll speak a little bit different to you. As we know that this prodigal son met those requirements just perfectly. And I think today you'll see something a little bit different out of it than maybe you've seen in the past. You know, uh, the prodigal son's been called the crown and the pearl of all parables. You know, I know that each time that I read it, especially as I studied it this week, it spoke to me a little bit differently. So let's go ahead and open up the word. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with his prodigal living. Keep in mind, as Jesus, as Jesus telling this story, those of you that had the letters in red, you'll find that this part of the scripture is in red. This is Jesus speaking. He's talking to a group of people, most of them were Jews, that he was speaking to. And he had just taught two other parables before this one. He taught one about the wandering sheep, about what happens. He says, if you have a sheep and one wanders away, you leave the other 99, you go seek out that one that was lost. The scripture even says that he picks the sheep up, puts him on his shoulder, then comes back and he has all the other shepherds rejoice with him because of the one that was lost is now found. Then he goes right from that parable into the story of the lost coin, about how an elderly woman, she loses a coin. She takes and she cleans her whole house and looking around and everything. Then she finds the one coin that she lost. She calls her neighbors over and she says, celebrate with me. I found the coin that was lost. Now as we get into this particular part of scripture, Jesus does not break the flow. He continues right in talking about something that is lost. But now he gets into something real personal. Now he talks about a soul, about a person. But he's going to keep the flow of going. This part of scripture really emphasizes God's mercy and God's grace. By the way, the word prodigal, it means to be wasteful. To be wasteful. If you look in different dictionaries like the NASB or the New Living Translation or or different ones, it will give a different word for the word prodigal. It will say, some translations say wasteful. uh, Some translations, they say reckless living. Some say wasteful living, some say riotous living, and the other ones say loose living. They all pretty much say about the same thing, don't they? Somebody that wasn't very careful with their life. Now, who is the prodigal? It's a person. It's a person who will walk up to his father and he'll say, I'm not really concerned so much about having a relationship with you. Just give me the goods. Just give me what's coming to me. 
Oh, I know that very well. And a lot of you do too. That when you were a young man, you were not concerned about nothing but yourself. How many of us can truthfully say, that was me? <laughs> we just cared strictly about ourselves and not about our family. Notice he didn't say here, please may I have the money? Or may I have the money? No, he didn't. He just says, give it to me. Just give me the goods. <laughs> you know, what he didn't take into consideration, that by him doing this to his father, it could have put his father in a, in a real bad situation, whether it be over finances or whether it be over the estate that they had. Because technically, back in that day, it was a law that, if, if like in this situation where there's two sons, the younger son would get one-third, the older son would get two-thirds. Now, technically, he didn't have to give this to his son until the day that he died, then the son would be entitled to it. But although also it was a law that a father could choose to take his inheritance and choose to split it up and give it throughout different stages in life. A lot of people do that today. They say, you know what, I want to take some of my inheritance, cash it in now, give it to my kids so I can watch them enjoy it a little bit. Instead of waiting until I'm died, then I can't see them use it at all. But in this situation, it was not a good scene. The son didn't want the money to do anything good with it. As a matter of fact, he could care less about his family in this particular situation. I believe that not only was this prodigal son after just the money, but I believe that he was also after independence in his life. He was tired of taking directions from his father. <laughs> I'm sure that he wanted the right to do as he chooses. At this time, he was tied down to his father's property. He had to go out and work. He had to listen to his father telling different things that he wanted to do. In other words, he wanted to cut, cut loose from his father and be kind of fancy free, uh, free to get out and do as he chooses. We're going to see here in the story exactly how this young man lived his life. He wanted to live his own life. He wanted to do his own thing. He rejected and he turned from his father and his father's way. Why? <laughs> because he felt that his father was probably restricting him. He felt that his father was probably limiting his freedom. He probably felt that his father was restricting his fun, restricting his pleasure. How many of us felt that way as a young man or a young lady? <laughs> We all did. So I could just imagine what's going through this prodigal son's mind. He didn't like discipline. As a matter of fact, people that are prodigal, people that are wasteful, people that are loose living, they don't care about anybody but, the, but themselves. <laughs> he was more interested in loose living than he was having any kind of boundaries within his own life. Note, this is really critical here, what the father did. The father gave it to him. The father gave him his freedom. He gave him his possessions. <laughs> Now with this large sum of money, we see the kid leaving. The son would now be able to do what he wanted to do. He was free from his father. He was free from the father's authority. And the father could do nothing about the choice that his son had made. That's something that we had to keep in mind. The father could not do anything about the choice that his son has made. How many of us have been in that situation or we're in that situation now? Your son or your daughter wants to do something. You really don't want them to do it, but they're bound and determined that they're going to do it. Here the father allowed him to do it. And we're going to go into detail on in that in just a few minutes. <laughs> he had to let him go. He had to let him do as he wished. Most of you can kind of relate to this. You find it very hard to do, but it's something that had to be done. Why would that father, knowing that this kid was rebellious, he was young, he wanted to get out, and he didn't want to take his father's direction anymore. He wanted to get out on his own, but why would he do this? <laughs> why would the father just up and do it when technically, by law, he did not have to do it? It says then that he left his father, and he left his father's ways, and he went out to a distant country. Now, it's kind of interesting because it says a distant country. He chose to go to a place that was much different than the way that his father had lived. The reason I say that, it says that he was, this country is full of carousing, partying, drunkenness, <laughs> a lot of immorality. The far country represents the state that Paul describes as being alienated from God. That's what the far country here represents, being away from God. 
being out there on your own, not being under directorship of the Lord. Augustine, as a matter of fact, he considered far country as being in an area, the forgetfulness of God, not being in God's presence, not even thinking about God. This was the far country. This is where that guy that got his money, went to his dad, said, give me the goods, give me the money, I'm getting out of here, I'll see you all later. This is the area that he chose to go. He chose to go somewhere where God, where he did not have to be in the presence of the Lord, where he didn't have to think about the Lord. He didn't have to think about somebody else saying, okay, son, you need to get up, it's time to go to work. Okay, son, it's time for us to eat lunch. Okay, son, it's time for, time for us to take a break. Okay, son, don't stay out too late tonight. Okay, son. Chose a far country to go to, some place where you didn't have to hear all this going on. <laughs> he chose to go somewhere where he could live a fleshly life. How many of us have been there? <laughs> I remember leaving home as a youth, telling my mother that I'm out of here. I'm tired of living under these rules. I'm tired of you telling me what time I got to be in at night. I'm tired of you telling me what I'm going to eat at night for dinner. I'm tired of all this. I'm getting out. My mom says, well, don't let the, Lord, uh, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. <laughs> she says, you want to go? I'll help you pack your stuff. And I thought, I could not believe my mother said this to me because I was the pride and joy of my mother's life. But she chose to do as his father chose to do. If you want to go, adios amigos. <laughs> I couldn't believe my mother said that to me. <laughs> I mean, she'd stand up and fight a grizzly bear over me, but yet... She says, go. <laughs> Look at verse 14. But when he had spent all, there he arose, or there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Oh, we see finally, the young guy here, he got out, don't have to take daddy's directions no more, went to the far country, there he got to the far country, things were great for a while, had a couple of jingles in his pocket, and he probably brought along some goods from home, and now that he's out there, he squandered it, he went through everything. <laughs> it's interesting because he squandered his money, he probably squandered the purpose of which his family had intended for him to do. How many of us would like for our kids to be able to do something, but then by them taking and going out and squandering like that, we see now their direction in life going a different way than what we had hoped. This is what happened to the father. Not only was he out of money, but now he kind of lost purpose in life. He kind of lost direction in his life. He lost many opportunities that he had coming to him by leaving the family. He misused everything that he had to do something. And you know what that something was? To satisfy his flesh. To satisfy his flesh. The lustful desires. Could be the alcohol. Could have been the women. Could have been the harlots. Could have been many different things. He wrapped his life up in the pleasures of the world. Now here he is. He squandered everything and there's nothing left around to help him. Nothing whatsoever. <laughs> there he stood empty. He stood bare. He stood all alone now. Not only was he broke, not only was he alone, but now he's hungry. Guess what? Being hungry kind of forced him to do something. You know what forced him to do? Get a job. Get a job. He couldn't find a job. So what did he do? It says he went to work for an alien. That was a person from another, he was in a different country there. He went to work for that person. You know what he did? He went to work in a piggery. And a pig pen, pig farm. Now, stop and think about this. Just imagine Jesus standing there telling this story like what I'm telling now, but you're a bunch of Jews and you don't believe in eating swine. <laughs> that had to been the most humiliating thing in the world for a Jew to do of that day would be to have to do anything to do with the pigs. But yet this kid did it. He got in there, he even had to eat some of the stuff that he ate. So now not only was he broke, alone, and hungry, it's interesting because as I was studying this, it made me think, what are some of the 
world's pleasures that we think about, that if I could just get away from home and just get out and do this, and if I could just do that, I'll be perfectly happy. Even today, what are some of the things? If I could just get this job, I'll be happy. If I could just get married, I would be happy. If I could just get more money, I would be happy. If I could just have that nice car, I'd be happy. Those are the pleasures that this guy was seeking, maybe in just a little different way, but he was trying to seek the pleasures of the world, just like so many of us are trying to seek the pleasures of the world today. The bad part is... Those things cannot satisfy you. That's why God put the void spot right there inside of each one of us, that vacuum. He puts that in us so that only He can fill it. But yet we try to fill it with everything else. All these things of the world, we try to fill that void spot. I know that when I was single, before I got married, I had, a, 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 I had my own shop. I lived on a golf course. I drove a nice Harley. My truck was fairly new. I always had a couple of jingles in my pocket. I traveled every Saturday. I'd get off work, go get on an airplane and fly somewhere and do a seminar on, on a, uh, for a company. It was a good life, but something was still missing. And I kept thinking, what is wrong? What am I lacking? I've got everything, but everything that I tried to fill that one spot with still left me void. It still left me empty. There was still nothing there to make me happy. I was still miserable. Same way this young man was. <laughs> In Galatians, it says that only a man who hungers and thirsts at the righteousness would be filled and bear fruit of God's Spirit. That's why God put that spot in us. We could try to fill it with everything else like this young boy did, but nothing worked. Nothing worked whatsoever. Now, with all this going on, not only did he not have money, he's eating pig slop, but he also lost his friends. He says no one gave him anything. <laughs> How many of us know that when you got money, you got friends? But when you ain't got money, all them people aren't around. I remember one time when I got, a, 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 got in trouble with the law and lost my license for a while, a couple of my buddies would come by and pick me up, they say, hey, we're going to watch Sunday. We're down to watch the football game. Come on, I'll be by about quarter to one, pick you up so we can get down there. And I said, okay, because I, I had the money. <laughs> We'd go in, I'd order us all around and stuff like that. My mother made the comment to me one day. She says, let me ask you a question, son. Why is it that your friends, they want to come around because of the money with you? They want to spend your money at the tavern. How come those same guys don't come around and pick you up to take you to your doctor's appointment? How come those same guys don't come by and pick you up and take you over to the grocery store? Why am I the one always doing that? She says, believe me, I don't mind. You're my son. I'll do it to the day I die. She said, but doesn't that tell you what your friends are after? They're only there for a good time. They're not there to really help you. Then when I quit drinking, those guys never come around no more because the good times were gone. I was no longer going out and buying the rounds. I was no longer going out and getting drunk with them and being a party or the guy telling all the jokes. I was no longer fun to him to be with. This kid, this prodigal son, he ran into the same situation. When he had the money and he had the goods, he had a lot of friends. But when he ran out of money and ran out of goods, his friends left him. They didn't even offer him nothing to eat, just like my friends didn't. They never offered to take me to a grocery store. And I remember when I quit drinking, I remember saying to the guy that was discipling me. His name was Fred. He was my apostle Paul that was speaking into my life. And by the way, you need somebody speaking into your life. Because if you don't, the devil will speak to you. <laughs> and you better get somebody with a Christian positive attitude speaking into your life. This guy was speaking into me. And I said, I don't know what to do. I said, now that I've quit drinking, I won't have any friends. How do I tell them that I can't do this or that? He says, oh, don't worry <laughs> about dropping them. They'll drop you. <laughs> you know what? It wasn't very long before they all quit coming around at all. They stood back and they watched. This is only temporary. Bill ain't going to stay doing this for very long. They were watching me to see if it was a real thing. 
This guy here now, he's lost his friends. He's hungry. He's broke. He's down and out. Everything in the world's coming against him. So here he is in a distant country, <laughs> eating pig slop. But yet he is from a wealthy family. Pig slop doesn't satisfy, does it? <laughs> and I got to thinking, you know what I considered the pig slop? It was a career, toys, trickets, all kinds of things that before in my life that I thought things that were going to make me happy turned out to be pig slop. The only thing that ever filled that void spot in my life was Jesus. <laughs> Not all the trickets, the toys, the Harleys, the, the money, everything like that. I'm talking about true satisfaction, true contentment. I'm not talking about feel good today and go on tomorrow. I'm talking about true satisfaction. That's where this young man was. Look at verse 17. But when he came to himself, those of you that write in your Bible, underline that or highlight or something. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? <laughs> and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go into my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Am I no longer worthy to be called your son? <laughs> I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Oh, that's kind of interesting because it says, He came to his senses. Hmm. That was... <laughs> He snapped out of his insanity. He came back to reality. You know, that's, that is, he began to think to himself. He thought about his father and how his father had enough food to feed everybody and then still had food to spare. Here he was without none of it. <laughs> he probably remembered how at one time, sitting down at that table and seeing all kinds of food everywhere. So much food that there was spare food left over. Now, here he is. He don't even have food to fill his stomach. It started playing on his mind. He started thinking, you know what? Maybe things weren't so bad at my house after all. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't so bad that I was told to do this and I was told to do that. Here he is, starving, lonely, unhappy, no purpose in life, without a friend or a family. Then all of a sudden he came to his senses and he thought, you know what? I need to humble myself. I need to humble myself. <laughs> I need to return to the Father. This was probably gnawing deeply on his heart. I need to return to the Father. Hmm. Look at verse 20. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and he had compassion. And he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer, wor no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And he began to be merry. Oh, <laughs> Here we see this prodigal son. He got up. He returned to the father. Keep in mind, this is where true repentance, true repentance takes place. It takes place at a point where a sinner, like the prodigal son here, he changes direction from where he's headed and turns around now heads towards the father. What is that saying to us? <laughs> that when we're walking away from the Lord and we're out here doing our own thing, true repentance is when we say, you know what? It's not about me. It's about the Father. Not about what I want. Not about what I have to say. And then we turn around and we look at Lord and we says, I've sinned against God, first of all, and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's true repentance. This is probably one of the greatest moments that that son would never, ever forget. What do you think he thought about when he was on his way home? <laughs> As he's walking down the road to go greet his father. What do you think went through his mind? I remember what I thought. <laughs> this boy's probably thinking, 
Well, I went out, I kind of sowed a couple of oaks, had a couple of fun, picked up a couple of harlots, spent all my money. What am I going to get when I get home? I remember what I thought when I was on my way home. I thought, man, am I going to get reamed out. <laughs> man, I'll probably be grounded for six months. <laughs> I remember thinking that as I was headed back home one day. <laughs> I thought, all I'm going to hear is, I told you, I told you, I told you it wasn't as good out there as what you thought it was going to be. But what did the father do? (laughs) What did the father do over this? His father seen him coming, then he ran towards him. The father ran towards the son. As I was studying this, it made me think, probably the father had to have been looking at all times for the son to see him coming from a far distance. And the father looked up and seen him coming from a far distance, and he ran up on the boy, and he smothered the boy with hugs and kisses. He smothered him with it. He was happy. His boy was back home. (laughs) That's all that mattered to the father, was that the boy was back home. What an example of our heavenly father. That when he sees one of his kids that's walked away, return back to him. What a sight that is. Whether it's a person that has never accepted the Lord and the Holy Spirit's been working on that boy. And that boy's went off on his own and so many times the Holy Spirit tried to tug on him and say, come to the Father, come to the Father. And now all of a sudden the Father sees that sinner come to him for salvation. Or somebody that already knows the Lord and they've walked away, they've backslidden, and now they're returning back to the Father. That's a picture of our Heavenly Father. (laughs) He's always desiring for you and I to come back to him. You know what? (laughs) In In the original way that this is read, It implies that God kisses the past into forgiveness. Kisses into the past into forgetfulness, I should say. (laughs) That when you and I return, He's there with open arms. He never looks back on the way that we've done things. The main thing is, is we're home. (laughs) We're with Him. That's what He cares about. (laughs) You know, there ought to be a witness or there ought to be a testimony or somebody testifies, say, praise God for that. (laughs) You know, there I was lost, but now I'm found. His father said he was dead, but now he's alive, now that he's back. He gave his son, he called up and he says, give him a robe. (laughs) Give him a ring for his hand. Give him shoes for his feet. Hey, let's get a meal prepared for that hungry, growling stomach that he's got. The boy that was walking away that didn't feel he was worthy, now he is welcomed back into sonship. He's welcomed back into the family. <laughs> Look at verse 25. Now, <laughs> his older brother was in the field, and as he came and he drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one to servants and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry, and he would not go in. Therefore his father came out, and he pleaded with him. So he answered, and he said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who was devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. And it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So here we see, imagine, imagine what would have happened if this prodigal son would have come home and the father hadn't seen him 
and his elder brother would have seen him up the road. What kind of greeting or welcome home do you think he would have got then? <laughs> Could have been a bad scene, couldn't it? <laughs> a lot of prodigal people, people who have walked out and living loose, when they return, they're greeted by people like his elder brother. They're greeted by people like these Jews that Jesus was talking to, these Pharisees. Then all of a sudden, when you take a guy that goes out and he lives a loose life, and he truly repents, and he comes in here, and us Pharisees greet him out the door, and we treat him the way this brother would his, was treating his brother. What do you think this prodigal son would think? What do you think that some guy coming in here that has been out there living loose living for a few years, he decides to get right with the Lord, and he comes walking in the front door of this church, and we greet him with the attitude of his brother, or some Pharisee attitude. This guy's going to say, you know what, I'm not welcome here. I'm not welcome here at all. I'm probably better off to go back out where I really was. At least I fit it in out there. Nobody looked down on me. Different attitude, isn't it? Much different attitude. <laughs> you and I, we're all prodigal sons. <laughs> we're all prodigal. Whether you're like the younger brother or whether you're like the older brother, you're still prodigal. As I was studying this, it made me think about, I've seen three sons here as I was preparing this message. Three sons. First time I read the story, I kind of related to the younger son because he showed immaturity, <laughs> as I often do. <laughs> you know, give me the goods, he said to the father. I remember saying something pretty close to that. And the father, so generous, so gracious, but here's the key words, so wise, so wise the father that he allowed his son his desire. When the son got tired of eating pig slop, the scripture said that the prodigal son, he came to himself. Paul said essentially the same thing when he said, like we studied over in Romans chapter 7, verses 16 and 17, that it was the sin within him that caused him to do that which he didn't want to do. Isn't it the same thing? <laughs> this boy wanting to do his own thing, that was the sin within him that caused him to do the things that he knew that he shouldn't do. How many of us have been there and been in that situation before? I think we've all experienced this at some time or another. When we were caught up in sin, we find ourselves doing things and saying things that we normally would not do. Whenever I was a drinker, I remember the next day, everybody saying, man, you were wild last night. And it got to the point where I remember saying, who do I need to apologize to today? <laughs> the only time that I can ever recall, just flat out, had to walk up and say, I'm sorry, I know I was wrong. I don't mean the only times, but the most times was when I was under the influence. I said things that I normally wouldn't say. <laughs> I did things that I normally would not do. But eventually, like the prodigal son, I came to my senses. And a lot of you can relate to it because you're just putting your name in the story instead of me putting my name in the story. <laughs> you can relate to exactly what I'm saying. But eventually we come to ourselves and we stop and we say, you know what, I'm tired of this. This isn't for me. I know there's got to be more to life than this. That's what this young boy here was thinking. Then we come to ourselves we, start, we come to our senses, and then we say, you know what? And I remember saying this, and I was living with my dad, and I remember my dad being out at night, wanting to party, me not have, and I have a job, and I worked at a hamburger joint, and I remember we lived about a mile and a half away, and I remember in the pouring down rain walking home at night because my father was out partying. And yet I chose to go live with him because he was never home to make me do things. But when I lived with my mother, I had house rules that I had to live by. But I remember walking home in the rain from that hamburger joint, and I remember pouring down soaking wet, and I remember saying to myself, you know what, <laughs> maybe that wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> At least when I lived with my mom, 
I never got soaking wet. She always come and picked me up. No matter what, she did things for me. Now, there was my father let me do things. Oh, he loved me, but he just had his own things to deal with. But yet, I remember thinking in my own mind, you know what? My mother loved me. She did for me. And I got thinking, you know what? <laughs> she did my ironing. <laughs> when I lived with my dad, I did my own laundry. I had made my own meals. But yet when I lived with my mom, everything was done for me. I got to thinking about all these things that night walking home in the rain. How many of y'all have done that? <laughs> you start thinking, you know what? Maybe it wasn't so bad after all. Then we head home. That's exactly what took place here. You know, the father knew that this was happening. He knew exactly what would take place. Notice it doesn't say here in the scripture that when the boy left, he went out and times got bad. Notice it doesn't say there in the scriptures that the father sent him a letter. And the father says, I know you're having it kind of tough. Here's a check for 50 bucks. Help get your bike. <laughs> the father didn't do that. The father knew that he had to let his son hit bottom. He knew that if he gave him any kind of help, what would happen? The kid would not learn a lesson. That's a hard thing. It's very, very hard to do. So the father let him hit bottom so that the son would come back to his senses. Moms and dads, this is the hardest situation you ever have to face is to let your son or your daughter wallow with the pigs. We're going through that right now, and it's hard. It's very hard. It's kind of interesting because Jesus gives us a promise in this. You know, he says, it's kind of interesting because I was studying about it. It made me think, you know what? It gives me a lot of comfort to know because in the Scriptures, in the book of John, it says that we are in the Father's hand never to be let go. Never to be let go. <laughs> now, if the Lord would never let us go, why did this prodigal son's dad let him go? <laughs> because keep in mind, we're to see illustrations here. We're to see representation here. We see ourselves, some of us in the prodigal son, some of us see ourselves in the elder son. Others of us see ourselves in the father position. Why did the father let the son go? <laughs> the father in this picture here in this parable represents our heavenly father. The prodigal pictures you and I. <laughs> Why would the father let his son go to a far country, why does our Heavenly Father allow you and I to go to a far country? If we're in His hand never to be taken away, why does He allow it? I believe that it's to illustrate what we call the bungee theology. <laughs> bungee theology. <laughs> I believe that there's a bungee cord wrapped around every one of us. <laughs> And I believe that on one end is tied around you and I, and on the other hand, it's in God's hand. You and I can walk away from Him, and you and I can get out and we can go out to the far country, out to the world, out to the fun, to the parties, just walking away from the Lord. The Lord's still on one end holding that bungee cord. The other end's wrapped around us, and we can walk away all we want. But guess what happens when we get too far back and too far out? Snaps back, doesn't it? Just like a bungee cord does. <laughs> we call this bungee theology. I've seen it a hundred times. I've been there myself. The problem is, is when it snaps back. What point are we at in our life when it starts to snap back? That's a good question. The question is not, Am I going to come back? <laughs> the question is, how hard am I going to hit when I do come back? We've seen here that this boy hit rock bottom, didn't he? How many of you can say that you've been the same place? <laughs> you had to hit rock bottom before you snapped back to the Father. Maybe like me, you're starting to say to yourself, 
Lord, don't let me stretch that bungee cord too far. <laughs> I'm tired of getting slung around. I'm tired of being popped back. <laughs> don't let me drift too far off from you, Lord. We see here that the prodigal son, he hit very hard. We don't know what the repercussions were because to his journey to the far country, we don't know what kind of pains that he come back with or scars or diseases. We don't know that. But we do know that there, there was a certain point where he come to his life and he said, I've got to return to the Father. I've got to return. And as he did, he began rehearsing what was he going to say to his father on the way back. It's kind of interesting because before he left, he said, give me the goods. But now that he's back home, he says, make me your servant. That's two different attitudes, isn't it? Give me the goods. And then he went out. And then when he came to his senses, he came back and he says, now make me your servant. How many of us have said that? <laughs> we want to go out and do our own thing. But then when we come back to the Lord, we say, I'm here. I learned my lesson. <laughs> Use me. Make me a servant of you. What is your prayer today? <laughs> is it give me the goods, Lord, or is it make me your servant? Very good question. That's something that we all need to ask ourselves. What is my prayer? Is it give me the goods, give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that? Or do we ever say, Lord, make me your servant. Show me where I can serve you. As we talked about Thursday nights, it's just like we need to go to the Lord with empty hands. And say, now you fill it. You fill my hands as you choose what you want me to do for you, how I can serve you. I want you to fill my hands. That is a prayer that we all need to, need to ask. <laughs> you know, when the son drew near, it says the father smugged him and hugs and kisses, not only out of affection, but also for protection. The reason why, if you look in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, it says there in 21, 18 through 21, it says that if a son is stubborn, he is rebellious, a glutton, a drunkard, as is talking about the prodigal, he was to be stoned. So here when this boy come back, the father ran up and put his arms around him. It's more or less like he was saying, don't you worry, <laughs> I'm going to protect you. Don't you worry, I'm going to protect you. That's why when your kids, when they return home, you put your arms around them. You let them know. Nobody's going to mess with you. You're back. Nobody's going to touch you the way that you are. You're my son. <laughs> then the father said, put the best robe on him. Who owned the best robe? The father did. <laughs> father saying, take my robe and put it on him. That's why in the book of Isaiah 61, it says that we are robed in the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians, Paul declared that we are the righteousness of God because we are robed in Jesus Christ. He says, put a ring on the finger. Ring spoke of authority. Spoke of authority. It says, put shoes on him. Only a person that lived within the main quarters of the main house could wear shoes. The servants didn't wear shoes. Only those of the household could wear the shoes. But the prodigal son, as we see here, he was more than a servant. He was a son. The father accepted him back. So on his way home, the prodigal son always thought, he was probably thinking through his mind, boy, <laughs> I'm going to get what I deserve when I get home. What do you think he deserved? Probably a beating. But instead, he got what he never dreamed possible. He got a blessing. He got a blessing. When he returned home, he thought he was going to be beaten. But instead, he got a blessing. So now we see what the son was like. We see what the father was like. But what about the elder son, the eldest? <laughs> what about him? First time I read this story, I was kind of amazed by the kindness of the father to the prodigal. But then my attention started shifting more, the more that I started studying it, about the one that says he was plodding away in the field. He says, what is that that I hear coming from the house? Another servant says, it's your dad. He's throwing a party. He says, your brother's back. What? Said the son, what do you mean he's back? What do you mean they killed a fatted calf for him? I've been working faithfully all these years. I've never broken any commandments that he's given. He didn't even offer me a young goat. 
Now keep in mind, a young goat was second class compared to a fatty calf. He says, you didn't even give me that. The father looked at his son. The boy refused to go into the house. He wouldn't even go where the party was going. Would you say there was a little rebellion taking place right there? Scripture says he would not even enter the house where everything was taking place. The father looked at him and says, you know what, son? <laughs> he may be the prodigal son. He may be the one who went out. But you know what? You got a problem, too. Your problem is legalism. <laughs> Your problem is that you think that because you went and you served me, you did this, you did that, you did this, you did that, you kept all the commandments, you work hard, you did everything. You're trying to earn all my favor by all your good works. It's not about good works. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you were so busy trying to make me happy that you never had time to party. You never had time to enjoy life because you are too busy trying to work because you thought you were going to get the big inheritance. Good example, isn't it? Good example. <laughs> the eldest son represents the Pharisees who Jesus... The, the Pharisees would always get upset with Jesus because Jesus was interested in sinners. He cared about those. He cared about people who had walked away. <laughs> the eldest son didn't care about his brother, did he? He didn't care any whatsoever. Not the first iota was he caring about. A lot of people that way today, they don't care about people around them that aren't saved. Like the oldest brother. He didn't care that his brother was back. He was more interested in what he was going to get out of the deal. So many people are that way. They don't take the time. They don't take the resources to be able to share with other people to get them saved. <laughs> Tell people all the time, if you don't have the time to get out and get involved, at least help support it financially so that other people can get out and do it. Don't just be concerned what you're going to receive. Like that boy, that eldest son, he was more concerned about what he was going to receive. <laughs> I just want to say, if you're doing works, even works outside of here, or you're even doing works in the church to receive what you think is going to be your big blessing, and you're working to think that those works are going to get you that big blessing, you're going to get just what you deserve, <laughs> not much. We're to work in the church, we're to work for the Lord, but not with the attitude to see what I can get back. James says that faith without works is dead. You have to, the, the, works is just a result of what the Lord has done for you. Works is not for salvation, works is not to receive blessings. Works is to say, thank you, Lord. Here's my hand. Fill up, Lord, with what you want me to do for you. It's not so I can get a higher reward in heaven, although we will. We'll get rewards in heaven according to thy works on earth. But you see the point I'm getting across, the motive that we do it for. We have to be very, very careful about what is our motives with things that we do. <laughs> but when the younger son, or what the younger son experienced, and what the older son had to learn was that the father's righteousness and his blessings his merriment, his parting, everything that was taking place was not according to works or energy. Everything that he received was simply because of God's grace and his mercy. That's how he received it. <laughs> this is a hard concept for us to understand or even grasp a hold of because we're raised up thinking there's no free lunches. We're thinking that if whatever's going to happen, i got to reach down, pull the bootstraps up, get ready and go do this. Well, maybe in the physical way, that's true. But in a spiritual way, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. Spiritually, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 2, 9, it says, For by grace have you been saved through faith, not that of yourselves, but as a gift of God, so no man can boast. Just by God's grace, everything. Let me ask you a question here. <laughs> Which one of these two do you think would be the better worker? Now that the prodigal son is back, you've got the elder son, this there. Now that the two boys are back working for Papa, Father, out there in the field, which one do you think is going to be the better worker of the two? Do you think it's going to be the one who was seen the love, the grace of his father? Or the other one? <laughs> I'll suggest to you, I believe that it was the one who had seen the grace and the love of the father, as opposed to the one that was just working strictly for herself. 
But as I was studying this, then I seen the third son. The first son was the prodigal. The second son was the elder. But the third son was the one who was telling the story. Jesus. You know, if you're an elder son still trying to prove that God should bless your marriage, that he should bless your job, he should bless you financially, he should bless your children, he should bless your ministry, <laughs> the question that we need to ask ourselves, are you a prodigal son that's still in the pig pen? Where are you at? <laughs> As I studied this, I got to looking at it, and as I was studying both boys, I got to thinking, you know what? <laughs> both of their stories challenge me. Both of their stories convict me. I've walked away. Now, i got to admit, since I come to the Lord, I have not backslid. When I say backslid, I have not walked away from the Lord. I'm not saying that boasting. I'm just saying that the Lord has given me that gift to stay close to Him since I've been saved. So I'm not boasting no way at all. But I can see what it's like to come to the Lord, as the prodigal son could do. But also I can see what it's like to be the elder son and have that pride issue going on too. They don't deserve that. <laughs> Who they think they are. They don't really deserve to get all that. <laughs> the scripture said in Matthew, This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. The Father declared at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. The Son, the Father said that the Son, I'm well pleased. Why was the Father well pleased with His Son? Because the Son never sinned. Oh, He was tempted. We know that for 40 days. He was tempted very, very much. But still He never sinned. Now this Son was much unlike the younger Son, wasn't He? Much unlike Him. He never wandered off into the pig pen. Our Lord never sinned. But yet he was also unlike the older brother too. <laughs> you know, for the second time Jesus heard his father say, this is my beloved son, was on the Mount of Transfiguration at the end of his earthly ministry. The father was happy with him at the beginning of his ministry, then he was happy with his son at the end of his ministry. At that point, having demonstrated that he could go through life and not sin, and it was possible to live a sinless life, I believe that Jesus could have right then launched off into heaven if he wanted to. He had done what he came to do. He lived that sinless, perfect life. But yet at the same time, he didn't. He could have said, you know what? I've worked hard. I've made it through. Tough luck, you prodigals. <laughs> but he didn't. He didn't do that. No, not at all. Instead, he descended from the Mount of Transfiguration unto the Mount of Calvary. He says, you know what, guys? I've done it. I've been where you are, and I've done it. You can make it. That's why I come, to help you make it. The Father, the Father sent me to help you get through this. The Father sent me. <laughs> he says, I come so that you might be forgiven for your sins. For your carnality. That's why I'm here. He's saying, hey, fellow prodigal, take heart. Good news, fellow plotter. Positionally, you are in Christ. That's what he says to you and I. Positionally, you are in Christ. Someday you're going to be in his image. That's prophetically. Someday you're going to be in his image. Three boys were sitting in a dugout talking. One boy said, my dad's a doctor, and he practices medicine. The second boy, he says, my dad's a lawyer, and he practices law. The third boy says, my dad's a Christian, but he doesn't practice anymore. Sad, isn't it? You being a father, especially, that's who I'm talking to, and the mothers, but today fathers, can your kids say that about you? <laughs> My dad doesn't practice anymore. He's a Christian, but he doesn't practice Christianity. If you're a prodigal son, return. <laughs> return. If somebody has walked away, return back to the Lord. Or if you're a plotting son, <laughs> one that believes in good works, guess what? The Lord opened the door so that you can run up to the Father, and he's got his arms open, 
He invites you back in. That's what it's all about, is the Heavenly Father. That's who you and I serve. What an example that we have as a father, as our Heavenly Father. When we want to know how to handle situations that come into our life, we need them to get in the habit of going to Him. What does our Father say about it? What does our Father do about it? Let's pray.